This is Trinity Storm and you are watching third part of what if Naruto learn forgotten martial arts. If you enjoy this video please like, share and subscribe to the channel. Now wasting no more time, let's start the story. Naruto hurriedly approached his destination after sensing his friend Gara's energy fading in some way. He wasn't sure why it was dwindling so quickly, but he'd find out soon enough. He walked out of Wind Country's deserts and eventually arrived in a forest with canyons and trees. As he walked, he encountered no resistance, but his good fortune ended abruptly when he encountered the expected resistance. And it came in the form of Itachi and Kisame, the Akatsuki duo tasked with dealing with and subduing him. Naruto would never let them stop him from achieving his goals. So, if it isn't Sushi Bitch and the Silent Asshole, have you killed any other clans recently? Have you spilled the blood of innocent puppies? Mocked Naruto, cracking his knuckles. He remembered reading about them in the bingo book in his spare time because he knew he'd most likely face some of the tougher nin in it because strong people usually tried to kill other strong people to prove their existence. So he knew who these two individuals were and was prepared to confront them. Look at him, Itachi. Seven years away from being declared legally dead, and the brat thinks he's hot shit, Kisame remarked with a smirk, as Itachi observed Naruto. Seven years away from that village did wonders for my being. I set out west and learned to survive the worst that life can throw at you, and I am glad I did, Naruto said, as Kisame grinned and Itachi's eyes narrowed slightly. So you spent your time alone getting stronger. Big deal. It still won't help you against us, Kisame said, while Naruto grinned because it was always the arrogant who underestimated him and died first. If I'm not such a big threat to you, why is Itachi still trying to cast me in a genjutsu with his eyes like he has with everyone else he has faced throughout his life? Naruto asked, as Itachi's eyes narrowed even more. So you found a way to make yourself immune to my genjutsu, interesting, Itachi said as Naruto scowled at him. You can stop praising me, Itachi. I know why you two are here, and it isn't to insult me or speak small praises at what I do. I can also sense you two aren't the real deal. You hide it well, even showing the various abilities one would find in both the real Itachi and Kisame. But Uzumaki's sensory perception can see through that weak shit, and right now I see two corpses being used as puppets to hold us off while my, because if you want to fight me, come at me yourself, or else I will find you and kill you where you hide. I have sensed your location and can be there in a few seconds if necessary. Consider this your first and final warning. Or else what brat? Demanded, Kisame, before Naruto kicked him in the midsection, sending the man flying back well over 200 feet. While Hokuto's style relied on pressure points to deliver killing blows, he was trained as a shinobi in his youth and used his acquired skills to harm his opponents before going in for the kill. That combined with the fact that what he had kicked was a dead body, so pressure points had died out with it, rendered its use obsolete. Fast. And strong, Itachi thought, looking over at Kisame, who had reverted to the dead body they had obtained for this jutsu. I'm curious, how are you blocking my Sharingan's power? Itachi inquired. Simple. My mind is too strong to succumb to your illusions, Naruto said, frowning even more. I discovered that a strong mind is immune to most illusions, and I have spent years strengthening my mind to protect it from such things. I don't believe you're truly capable of protecting yourself from my gaze, Itachi said as he increased their power, but frowned as he saw that they weren't doing what they were supposed to do. You are immune only because I am using a puppet with a fraction of my power. So you tell yourself. Naruto said before moving faster than even the fake Itachi's eyes could follow and being struck across the face with the blonde's chakra where the eyes were located. He channeled energy into the seal that turned the dead body into a puppet and felt where it was going. He used it as an anchor to teleport to the cave hideout where Kisame and Itachi were. He noticed them sitting in a meditative state, as they needed to keep control of their puppets. To say they were surprised would be an understatement, as shock could be seen on their faces. Kisame was the first to recover from the shock and pick up his sword to attack Naruto. Naruto easily avoided all of his strikes, 
but after the seventh one, Naruto leapt over him, poking the side of his neck as he landed behind him. Kisami's vision blurred as he swung his sword blindly, not knowing where Naruto was because the poke on his pressure point was interfering with all of his senses. Don't bother struggling, Naruto said as he approached Kisame. Kisame was taken aback because he had appeared out of nowhere. However, Naruto poked him in the brow, applying energy to a pressure point. His body stiffened and his arms flew out beside him. Bone Crusher Strike by Hokuto Kisame looked at his body as Naruto walked away from him, surprised because nothing had happened. That all changed when his body began to sag in various places. Kisame exploded so quickly that only his legs remained, and they fell over because there were no motor functions left to keep them level. Itachi backed up in fear, seeing how easily his partner had been killed with a single touch. He quickly recovered from the shock, however, and activated his eyes. Sukuyomi, Itachi said as he locked Naruto in his illusionary world. But if he had looked closer at Naruto, he would have noticed the slight smirk on his face as he succumbed to the genjutsu. Illusion. Naruto was being nailed to a cross in a dark world. He'd read about it years ago and knew exactly where he was. Itachi appeared in front of him as he sat on a rock, looking up at him. You will suffer for the next 72 hours, Itachi said with the emotionless tone Naruto expected him to have because it went hand in hand with him. Well, Naruto said, rolling his eyes, while that seems like a good time for the two of us, I'm going to have to pass on that offer. He flexed his muscles slightly, and lines of light flashed on his arms as he did so, breaking free from the nails that held him in place. How did you do that? Itachi wondered, because it shouldn't be possible. What breaking free from my bindings? Naruto inquired, raising an eyebrow, that alone is easy because I had years of forced practice courtesy of the village of Konoha, but if you think that is impressive, allow me to utterly blow your mind with this. Naruto then clapped his hands in front of him, and as he did, lines of light traveled towards the center of his chest, where a complex seal was painted on him. The world of the illusion changed to the polar opposite of what it was as the seal was activated. Instead of darkness, there was nothing but white. Itachi looked around in surprise, and before he could respond, a chair appeared beneath him, knocking him off his feet and forcing him to sit. Bindings wrapped around his arms and legs, immobilizing him. What exactly is this? This is an ancient seal created to counter this ability. Can you explain, because I've never heard of such a thing? Of course you wouldn't, Naruto said as he summoned a chair and sat across from Itachi, because your clan wouldn't want something like this to be widely known to the people, and your clan has a habit of omitting things from their history to make them look better than they really are. You are one of the only Uchiha in the recorded history of your clan, which the Uzumaki kept extensive records of for safety reasons, the likes of which. This still doesn't explain how you managed to counter my genjutsu so well. Well, that is simple to explain. About two generations after the founding of our clans, one of your clan's females fell in love with one of mine's males. I don't remember names even though they were written because honestly, you are the only person I will probably ever tell this story to so remembering them isn't really top of my to-do list. But they were in love, and while the Uzumaki were all for their union, the Uchiha were not. Are you going to torture me like I was going to torture you? No, Naruto replied with a shake of his head, I have no plans to torture you. I just want to talk because I have a few questions for you. And exactly what do you want to know? Why were you literally the only shinobi on duty who protected me when you were still a member of Konoha's forces? So you knew it was me, Itachi said with a smile. It wasn't difficult to figure out who my protector was after I followed you around a few times. How did you manage to follow me? Itachi inquired, raising an eyebrow, because he had left the village when Naruto began his first year at the Ninja Academy at the age of eight, so he had no prior training at the time, and even then, for a newly trained shinobi to follow a highly trained Anbu was unheard of. You're looking at a man who has been able to avoid shinobi of various levels since the age of five who were out to hurt me, Naruto said, a smile on his face. 
following you wasn't so difficult when you weren't expecting me to. But the real question is, how did you do it? You're seriously asking that question? Said Naruto. I am the son of two prodigies, with my mother being a strong Uzumaki and my father being the most infamous shinobi of his generation, plus throw in the fact that the demon sealed inside of me that everyone despised helped to train me in secret and I was a force to be reckoned with. How else would I have been able to pull off my pranks when I was younger? That is quite impressive. You were Kashina's son. It is now your turn to respond to my question. Why did you protect me? It was years ago, when I was still a child growing up, and the Yandaimi had yet to be made the Yandaimi Hokage. Kashina was thinking about taking on an apprentice, but the pickings were slim, and few were even less worthy than anyone would be now in the leaf. She was walking by one day, seeing me train hard at one of the more open training grounds, and saw my potential before anyone else. So she asked me. He was more thinking about his mother saving him or something. If what you said is true, did she ever teach you the sealing arts our clan was known for? Naruto inquired. No, she didn't have time to teach me that at all. My idiot father found out and went to the Sandame Hokage before his retirement to ban her from ever continuing the apprenticeship because he felt the Uchiha clan's pride was above training an Uzumaki in the ways of being a shinobi in any subject. Not surprising given the Uchiha family's history, Naruto nodded. The Sandame then told your father that if Kashina didn't stop teaching me, the mantle of Hokage would go to my father instead. I don't have to tell you how your father viewed Kashina being the Kayubi Jinchuriki or the fact your mother refused to marry him when he asked. My own mother was a silver medal to him and he was always jealous of your father for taking what he felt was rightfully his to have in life. We could have been like brothers in another lifetime, Naruto sighed as he stood up. I would have liked that, Itachi said with a genuine smile on his face, you were everything that I wished for Sasuke to be, but things didn't go the way I planned. For what it's worth, Naruto said as he prepared for what he needed to do now that the genjutsu had broken and they were back in the real world. Itachi was still unable to move because the seal used to counter his genjutsu had a paralyzing effect on the original jutsu's caster. I'm sorry for what I have to do, but I need your head to send a message not only to your brother, but to the rest of Konoha, that I am not to be messed with. I understand, Itachi said, smiling. Naruto took an attacking stance and quickly wiped away the single tear that had fallen from his eye because he had to hurt the only person in the village who had saved him. But he sucked it up and did what needed to be done. After 10 minutes. Naruto continued walking towards his destination, but this time he was carrying a medium-sized scroll on his back that contained Itachi Uchiha's head. As he walked, he noticed his friend Gara's energy dwindling so he hurried up and eventually came to a large boulder that blocked the entrance to the hideout where they were keeping him. I'm not sure what they were thinking when they thought of the door, Naruto said as he noticed the boulder. This literally screams evil lair with all the red flags that go with it, Naruto said, pointing to the seal on it, which was augmented by several others in the area that had to be pulled if he was to remove this one. But Naruto decided to take the easy way out, something that would make any Nara proud, and simply punch the boulder. The seal basically made the boulder stronger than it was naturally, but Naruto was trained by a man who could literally punch down a skyscraper and was stronger than Kenshiro, as was the case with the Hokuto successor, and breaking a seal-enhanced boulder was a piece of cake. As he walked in, he noticed what appeared to be projections of some kind vanish, leaving only three figures in the room. One had slanted blue eyes and long golden blonde hair that he wore in a half ponytail with the rest falling freely. Naruto recognized him as Didera because he had read a bingo book in his spare time in order to familiarize himself with any and all potential future opponents. He recognized the other as Sasori, but that wasn't important right now because his attention was focused on his friend Gara's dead body. Naruto's rage erupted because he was too late to save him, but he didn't despair because he would avenge him. Who the hell are you? Didera wondered as he gathered some clay to kill this guy. The worst kind of person to irritate, Naruto said as he walked towards him, cracking his knuckles. 
Didera freaked out and attacked by throwing small clay birds at him because he was a long-range fighter and his opponent appeared to be short-range. The birds flew forward and hit their target, making Didera smirk, but that smirk quickly vanished when the smoke cleared and he saw Naruto was unharmed and still walking towards him. Sasori decided to attack him, launching his razor-sharp tail at an incredible speed, but to Naruto, it appeared to be moving much slower than it actually was, making dodging easy. He grabbed the tail with one hand and yanked hard enough to break it free from Sasori. He then swung it at the two of them, hitting Didera with enough force to knock him backwards while breaking Sasori's outer puppet skin, revealing his true body to Naruto. So you disguised yourself as a puppet, Naruto said as he took a fighting stance, that was very clever, he added, but I'm not here to compliment you. I'm here to kill the two of you. Sasori didn't say anything, instead launching strings from his back that attached to his arm. Sasori yanked hard to bring Naruto closer, but Naruto was like a solid boulder and stood still. Naruto simply smirked at his attempt before turning the tables and pulling Sasori towards him. Naruto had punched him in the vital pressure points before slamming his open palm into his chest, forcing him backwards away from him. Naruto stood there counting to three before frowning when nothing happened. He was certain he had reached his pressure points. I see you fight like the Hyuga and aim for chakra points, Sasori said as he pulled out a scroll that, when opened, summoned the puppet he created out of the third case cage. But that won't work on me because I made myself a puppet. While that may be true, Naruto said with a smirk, and he considered himself fortunate that on his way back to the elemental nations after burying Kanshuro, he met a man who taught him the fundamentals of a style that was diametrically opposed to Hokuto's. But hitting your pressure point isn't the only thing I learned on my journey. While I am no master of the Nanto style of fighting, I learned the basics in case I needed to use them on someone like you. Naruto then charged forward with curved fingers rather than solid fists because he was going to cut rather than punch. Sasori launched his puppet to intercept Naruto, but it was too late because he was there one moment and then behind him the next. Sasori saw his puppet explode into pieces, and he was able to see Naruto before his body exploded into pieces as well. I really dislike using that style, Naruto sighed as he stepped over to the pieces of Sasori's body and came to a halt when he saw the canister containing his heart. Naruto picked it up and crushed it with his hands, effectively ending Sasori's life. He stood there for a while, thinking about what would drive a man to go so far as to turn himself into a puppet like he had. As he stood there contemplating it, he was hit in the back by more explosions thrown at him by Didera. Hey genius, Naruto said as he turned around in rage at being attacked from behind, that didn't work the first time, so what could have possibly gone through your mind to make you try again when the first time didn't work? I'm optimistic, Didera said as he prepared a larger dose of explosive clay this time, unlike you. You came here alone and expected to beat us? And you have the audacity to insult me? Isn't the dead body lying in pieces a clear indication of how this is all going to play out for you? said Naruto, grin on his face. Plus, you're a moron for saying that. And what are you talking about? I didn't come by myself, Naruto chuckled. Didera looked at him with a puzzled expression. As he was pierced through the chest with three fox tails, his confused expression was quickly replaced by one of pain. Didera began to bleed from his mouth and cried out in agony as the tails inside him tore him into three pieces. Nice to see you, Kurama, Naruto said as he watched the Kyubi burn the body to ash. Well, I wasn't going to let you have all the fun, Kurama said as he led Naruto to Gara's body. While the Kyubi was free to roam the world as he pleased, he had grown attached to Naruto over the years that he had been sealed within him and healing him. He could return to the seal whenever he wanted or if Naruto required his power. He slept in there most of the time because now that he had freedom, he could use his power to decorate his caged area to his liking. Naruto had essentially turned into his mobile home. Naruto requires his power right now in order to revive Gara. So Kurama jumped back into the seal to give Naruto more power. 
Naruto focused his power into his hands, which he placed on his chest. He then infused his body with electricity, as well as healing chakra. He continued to pulse more and more energy into him, until he finally felt a pulse. Gara coughed loudly as his body filled with air once more. Naruto was relieved to see his friend alive again, but he would need to see a doctor once he returned to the village. He was about to pick up Gara's body to Hiroshin out towards Suna, mentally patting himself on the back for throwing a kanai when he started walking this way so he could get back faster, when he noticed five people behind him. Well, if it isn't the three people I wished I'd never see again in my life, Naruto said as he rose to his feet. He looked around to see his old team standing there, as well as a young man with a fake smile on his face and another Jonin Shinobi he'd never seen before, but whose energy felt familiar in some way. Naruto, Kakashi exclaimed, surprised because he hadn't expected to find him here of all places. Good to see you remember my name after all these years. It's been seven, and damn you all look better for it. Sakura finally has some visible tits on her, and Sasuke has longer hair. Naruto, Sasuke grinned, seeing an opportunity to avenge his humiliating defeat all those years ago, at last I can settle the score between us and personally send you to hell myself. Yeah, agreed Sakura, but Naruto just rolled his eyes at the banshee still being a Uchiha fangirl after all these years. You couldn't beat me before, even when I had little to no training and you had everything you could handle, so what makes you think things will change now? I was trained by Sanin Jiraiya himself, something you were never allowed to complete because you were pathetic. And is that supposed to scare me? Because Jiraiya is a joke as a teacher, and in the seven years I've been away, I've been trained by a man who is stronger than all three Sanin combined. And who is the man who would teach you anything? Sasuke inquired. It doesn't really matter since the man died two years ago. I know this because I buried the man next to his wife when he passed, but I am glad I ran into you here of all places because I come bearing a gift for you Sasuke. Naruto took the scroll off his back and tossed it to Sasuke, who used his eyes to see if there was any kind of trap on it, but saw none, so he opened it up and activated the seal. When he was activated, a wooden box appeared in his hands, which he opened and then dropped in shock. The box contained his older brother's head. When he dropped it, the box exploded, and when the smoke cleared, there was nothing left of it. How does it feel to have the very purpose that drives you forward in life taken away from you? Smirked Naruto. He felt as Sasuke's rage grew and he charged a senjutsu enhanced Chidori into his hand. I'll kill you! yelled Sasuke as he charged forward to slay the man who had made it impossible for him to avenge his clan. Kakashi tried to stop him, but Sasuke was too fast for him. Naruto simply smiled as he easily avoided his jutsu and grabbed him by the throat. You know what I like about you, Naruto said as he channeled power into a finger on his opposite hand, you are so easy to manipulate and for that I will grant you a gift so that the next time we meet you can fight me at full power so there are no excuses when you die by my hands. Naruto then poked him between the eyes, causing him to scream in pain, before tossing him towards Team 7, which had begun charging at him. He used their being knocked over as an opportunity to grab Gara and Hiroshin before they could see him use it because they were too focused on getting Sasuke off of them. When they rose to their feet, they discovered that Naruto and Gara had vanished. However, before they left, they noticed Sasuke smiling as his eyes bled from the unlocking of his Mangekio Sharingan. He now had the ability to kill the Dobi once and for all. Suna. Naruto returned Gara to his home village, much to the surprise of his sister, who, like the rest of the village, had assumed he had died seven years ago. She was relieved to see both him and her brother alive and well. While Gara was being examined to ensure that everything was in order, Naruto used his chakra to extract the poison that Konkuro had been injected with when he fought Sasori to protect his family. It took some effort, but he was able to expel it from his body. Gara was given permission to leave the hospital after he finished assisting Konkuro. He had invited Naruto to his home to thank him for assisting him in reviving him. 
They drank a bottle of special sake he had been saving for a special occasion, and being resurrected by a friend he thought was dead seemed like the ideal occasion. As they drank, he and Naruto discussed many topics, including the future of the world at the time, as well as Naruto's travels in the West. Tamari joined in on the drinking, and Naruto noticed her staring at him as she drank. It didn't take long for Tamari to get drunk and leave, which Gara explained was because she was a light drinker. Gara invited him to stay in their guest room for a few days. He had offered the room for longer, but Naruto mentioned that he needed to get somewhere and that a few days would suffice. Gara had gone to bed, and Naruto had settled into his bed when he heard the door to the room open and saw Tamari enter and close the door behind her. He raised an eyebrow, sipping more sake he had purchased earlier. What are you doing here? Tamari lied down on the bed, smiling. I broke up with Shikamaru when you were banished seven years ago, she replied as he sipped his sake again. That's good to know, he said, but why are you in my room? She pouted. Can't I go out for a drink with an old friend? She grumbled. The following day. Tamari awoke from a deep sleep that had relieved her of the stress of the constant missions she had been on for the past few weeks. She felt two arms wrapped around her waist and something hard but still warm on her back, and then she felt Naruto's face buried in the back of her neck and blushed as memories of last night returned to her, and she tried to scoot out of his grip to avoid the embarrassing position Naruto would wake up in, but he pulled her closer and buried his face in the back of her neck a little more as her blush intensified. She decided to sleep a little longer, so she closed her eyes, got comfortable, and braced herself for the impending embarrassment. Gara and Konkuro came downstairs, exhausted, and sat on the couch. Konkuro had been released from the hospital a few hours before and had returned home immediately. Man, that poison was a pain to get rid of. Thank Kami Naruto was there to help us, Konkuro said as Gara nodded in agreement. They had both faced the Akatsuki members sent to capture Gara, and both had proven to be too formidable for them to overcome. Hey! Where's Tamari? She's usually up and about now, Konkuro inquired, and Gara nodded in agreement. Yes, she must be sleeping in, he said monotonously as he and Konkuro stood up and made their way to the stairs. Okay, I'll wake her up, make us some breakfast, and then sleep because the food at the hospital stinks, he said, and Gara nodded because he had eaten it before when he was younger, and it did indeed stink. He followed him upstairs because he needed to get something from his room as well. Konkuro entered Temuri's room and knocked, but received no response. He knocked a few more times and called her, but received no response. Gara came out of his room and saw him still standing in front of her door. What's wrong? He asked stoically, turning Konkuro around. Tamari isn't answering the door, should we go in? He asked nervously, and Gara went into deep thought for a moment. Tamari didn't like it when people came into her room, especially in the morning, and she would chase them out with any sharp object she could get her hands on. But he was protected by his sand. However, Konkuro. He wasn't as fortunate. Yes, we should, he said, and Konkuro nodded and opened the door, both surprised to see the room empty after Tamari had returned home the night before. Gara had an idea after remembering the looks she gave Naruto after she got drunk the night before. Konkuro, I think I know where she is. He said as he walked towards the guest room with Konkuro in tow, who was completely confused but shrugged and followed as Gara opened and entered the room with Konkuro behind him and stopped dead in their tracks when they saw Tamari. They were taken aback when they saw her cuddling up to Naruto under a blanket that covered their naked bodies. Konkuro's jaw dropped to the ground and he began muttering incoherent words while pointing his index finger at the blondes in bed, while Gara's eyes widened briefly. Tamari was sleeping with her back against Naruto's chest, his arms wrapped around her waist and his face buried in her flowing blonde hair. Tamari awoke fully awake after hearing her brother freak out, and when she saw them standing there, she screamed in shock as she wrapped her body in the blanket that covered the two of them and ran to her room, her face flushed with embarrassment. Konkuro fainted as she rushed past him, unable to get over the fact that she had just discovered his sister in bed with someone. 
Gara just silently nodded in agreement because he saw Naruto as good enough to date his sister, and used his sand to drag Konkuro to his room to rest while he cooked breakfast. Naruto stayed for three days as promised, and Tamari went out of her way to avoid him because she was embarrassed about what had happened. But, as he was packing his belongings and making his way to the village gate, she appeared and inquired about the status of their relationship. He admitted to her that he was married, but he qualified for the Clan Restoration Act because he was the only male Uzumaki. She kissed him goodbye, and he slapped her on the ass, making her face light up with delight. She turned around to speak to him, but he had already left. Tamari looked off and saw a dot in the distance, and as it vanished, she felt lonely and wished Naruto would return to hold her, but she was a patient woman and could wait until he returned to jump him again this time without the need for an aphrodisiac. Spring Valley Naruto walked through the lovely countryside on his way to his friend Koyuki's palace. He hadn't been here in a long time, but he was still able to enjoy the scenery because he took his time walking. While his plan was on a timetable, the deadline had been greatly extended now that he had the assistance of both Iwa and Kumo. Onoki had told him through one of his village's summons that Kumo was along for the ride as long as he did his part of the plan as agreed, which he would do because he had no love for the village because they all hated him and he didn't care about their survival. All Kumo really wanted was a Hyuga for their village to breed, and they'd get more than one if everything went as planned. Naruto had already taken what was his by birthright out of the village, leaving the rest up for grabs. As he approached Spring Country's capital, he was surrounded by a group of shinobi and samurai. Naruto raised an eyebrow at this because it was the first time he had ever seen them work in unison like this, but this part of the world didn't have a proper shinobi village, so they would mostly be samurai. So it wasn't so surprising to see them working together like this. State your reason for being here and reveal your face, the captain of the group said as the rest of them brandished their weapons in preparation for a fight. It's okay, Naruto said as he removed his hood. My name is Naruto Uzumaki, and I've come to see my friend Koyuki, the men surrounding him said angrily as they heard his name. You dare to claim to be our country's hero, the captain yelled angrily, he died because those bastards in Konoha murdered him. They tried, Naruto chuckled, but their efforts were futile. Bind him, said the captain, you are under arrest for dishonoring our country's hero, and we will bring him before Koyuki to judge personally. Naruto's first instinct was to fight, but after hearing the second part about being taken to Koyuki, he decided to let them bind him without a fight because he could easily break free from them if needed. So they marched him through the streets to the palace, where he was led to the throne room and forced to kneel in front of Koyuki himself. Why have you brought this man before me? Koyuki asked, but she couldn't recognize Naruto because he had bulked up so much due to time and training. He's dishonored our hero by claiming to be him, your highness, the captain said as he knelt in front of her. How dare you claim to be Naruto, Koyuki snarled as she rose from her seat and approached him. She snatched his head and forced him to look her in the eyes. Give me one good reason why I shouldn't execute you right now. Because I know you won't kill the man who saved you no less than three times, Naruto smirked. As I told you years ago, no matter how much you despise it, I'll come after you wherever you are, and then I saved you by outrunning a train, Koyuki said, which made Naruto laugh because he saw that she remembered him. Is that really you, Naruto? She asked, slightly concerned that this was a ruse. In the flesh, Naruto said as he rose to his feet. As he opened his arms in a hugging gesture, he easily broke the bindings on his hands. Koyuki took the hint and hugged him with tears in her eyes, surprised that her friend was still alive when she and everyone else assumed he was dead. Come on now, there's no need for tears, Naruto said as he wiped away her tears. I'm just glad you're alive, Koyuki said with a smile. What have you been doing all these years? I've been past the wall with my sensei, Naruto said, crossing his arms and smirking. I was trained in the wastelands past them in a fighting style that trumps many in existence, and while there I bulked up as you can plainly see for yourself, Koyuki said, blushing as his muscles made him far more attractive than he was when he was a kid and saved her. 
While I am glad you are alive and well, Koyuki said as she sat back down on her throne. She made a hand motion towards her guards, indicating that they were no longer required to protect her from their hero. I'm curious, why are you here now? What? Said Naruto, a grin on his face, I can't come and visit a friend after not seeing them for eight years? Koyuki just looked at him, uh, are you kidding, look on her face. Alright, you got me there. I need a favor that only you can provide. And what favor can I do you? Koyuki asked, her voice tinged with lust. She was hoping Naruto was hinting at an intimate encounter because her advisors had wanted her to bear an heir to the throne for several years in order to avoid any sort of power struggle in the future, but she had been against it for the longest time because she felt like no man was right for her. Now that the man who had saved her life had arrived, he was far more attractive than he had been years before, and she could use him to sire an heir for her. I need diplomatic status to enter Konoha, Naruto explained. His words jolted Koyuki out of her reverie because they were the last thing she expected to hear from him. Why do you need or even want to return to the village where everyone thought you were murdered? I have a plan that requires me to return to do a few things, Naruto shrugged, and while I really don't want to go there, I will need diplomatic status to stop them from trying to control me, which I know is exactly what they want to do to me. What are your intentions there? I'd rather keep that information to myself, Naruto smiled, just so I know the plan isn't leaked ahead of time. Well, I trust you, Koyuki said, pausing to consider the question. She smirked as she looked at Naruto, who knew exactly where her mind was at because his wife gave him the same look before jumping him and fucking her for the next hour or two. And I will grant you your wish, but I will ask for a favor in return. I know exactly where you're going with this, Naruto chuckled, so do you want to do it here with the risk of your staff walking in on us, or do you want to do it somewhere more private? Koyuki just coughed in surprise, blushing profusely. She quickly recovered from her coughing fit, grabbed his hand, and led him to her bedroom. Once inside she kissed him deep with tongue before he could react. Wait, Naruto said, pulling her lips away from his, I need to tell you something before we do this. And what exactly is that? I am already married, Naruto said, making Koyuki stiffen with rage because her hero was a lecherous pig who was cheating on his wife. And yet you've come here to seduce me? Wow! Naruto exclaimed, holding up his hand in mock defense, I may be married, but I am also the last male of my clan, so I can have multiple wives because I qualify for the Clan Restoration Act. You do. Koyuki said as her rage subsided, and your wife is okay with it? Of course she is, but I have to tell her who I fucked and be completely honest about how I did it because she is kinky like that and constantly drains the clones I send to satisfy her. Konoha, one week later. Naruto arrived in the village with his hands in his pockets and his hood up in a, I don't care, stance. He approached the two guards on duty which surprised him because he expected more given that they were in the midst of preparing for war, but their numbers could be running thin as it is, so this was probably all they could spare. He handed the scroll to the guards, who read it and looked at him with hatred in their eyes because they wanted to run him through with their weapons, but he had diplomatic status and was not to be attacked. He returned the scroll as one of them told him to wait until the higher-ups arrived for the meeting he was here for. Naruto simply walked past the remaining guard, who attempted to stop him, but Naruto shoved him to the side, knocking him out with the force of his head hitting the wall behind him. Naruto walked towards a specific location because he had some time on his hands and a score to settle with a certain duo from his past. As he approached his destination, he was surprised to see that the Ichiruka ramen stand had evolved into a full-fledged restaurant rather than a simple stand. It was quite large because it served many shinobi for dinner as well as the day's lunch rush. Naruto grumbled to himself as he saw this location, as all of his memories of it surfaced. It was easy to see why this place was so successful when they were notorious in the village for drugging and poisoning the demon brat with their Naruto special, that they made him with those goddamn smiles on their faces. Naruto had always known about the poison and drugs in his food, since he was far smarter than he ever let on, 
but it was the least rotten thing he had to eat, and the chakra of the Kyubi filtered it out in a manner that made him immune to it over time. And, given the frequency of his visits to their stand, his immunity to poison and drugs was fairly high, even before his seven-year intensive training with Kanshuro. Naruto walked up to the door with an open sign and entered. Inside, there was plenty of seating, including multiple booths and square tables that could seat up to four people. Then there were the seats near the cooking station that looked like the old stand. There was also a fireplace in the corner, with a fire burning at the time, giving the space a warm family feel. On the wall was a paper in a glassed frame, and as Naruto looked at it, he noticed the label, Naruto Special, which listed all of the poisonous ingredients that had been placed within it. Along with the recipe were photographs of him taken when the villagers tortured him in his youth, and as he looked at them, he had to suppress the rage that was building up inside of him. As he passed through the door, the little bell above it rang to alert whoever was in the back that there was a customer, and Ayame appeared in her usual cooking attire to greet him. Hello, she said cheerfully, smiling, only one of you, please take a seat at the counter, sir. Naruto sat down at the counter and twiddled his thumbs while holding his hands together in a ball on the counter. Here's a menu for you, Ayame said as she handed him a menu to peruse, please let me know what you want me to make. Where is Tucci? Naruto inquired. My father went to deliver a list of supplies he needed delivered to restock our inventory. Sir, have you decided what you want? Yes, Naruto said, a smirk on his face she couldn't see, I'd like the usual please. I'm sorry, sir, Ayame said, frowning slightly, but I don't know you well enough to know what you usually get. Please give me the Naruto special. When Ayame heard that, she frowned deeply. Sir, we don't make that for people. We only made it when the demon brat was younger to weaken him. I know, Naruto said as he looked up and pulled down his hood, and Ayame's face turned pale as she realized who she was speaking to, and I found it delicious when I was a kid, so why not make it for me again? Nah. Nah. Naruto, Ayame stuttered, terrified of what was about to happen to her. Yes, Ayame, Naruto said as he looked at her, it's your number one customer, he noted as he spoke, and saw her hand move slowly to grab a knife to attack him. That, too, will not work, so don't even try. Ayame, on the other hand, ignored his warning and attempted to slash at him with her cutting knife. Naruto only needed two fingers to catch it as he grinned at her and twisted his hand slightly to break the blade off at the handle. Ayame turned around to flee, but Naruto was one step ahead of her and kicked a section of the counter hard enough to break it up and block the kitchen entrance. Ayame turned around as she backed up to the blockade, which had now cornered her. I'm really going to enjoy this, Naruto said, cracking his knuckles. Each crack caused Ayame's face to lose even more color, until she was nearly paper white. She tried to flee once more, this time towards the front door, but Naruto took a stance and punched her in multiple pressure points in the blink of an eye, causing her to cough up blood. He grabbed her by the head and twisted her body around to face the fireplace after delivering the final blow. Walk Punch Hokuto. Burden of Regret, an actual technique from the anime. Weird name though. Ayame started walking towards the fireplace against her will. She begged Naruto to show mercy the entire time. That she was sorry and felt remorse for what she had done, but Naruto didn't care because she was full of shit. She walked right into the fireplace, where her clothes slowly caught fire and began to burn her. As she screamed in agony, Naruto placed a silencing seal on the wall and moved a chair next to the door, but in such a way that you didn't notice it right away. He stood there for 12 minutes watching Ayame burn alive in the fireplace before Tuchi arrived. Naruto would have preferred to kill this jerk in a gruesome manner, but he was pressed for time and simply poked him in the head to paralyze him and threw him into the fireplace to burn alongside his daughter without so much as a greeting or explanation of why he was doing so. He made three shadow clones to do three separate things that needed to be done in the village, before he used the Hiroshin to teleport himself out. His clones left, 
but not before flipping the sign to the closed side, where it would remain indefinitely. After 20 minutes. As Naruto arrived, the civilian council, shinobi council, and clan heads were all gathered in the meeting room. When Naruto arrived with his hands in his pockets, he basically kicked the door open and took a seat in front of everyone. He sat back in his chair, his feet resting on the table. Naruto could sense their hatred for him, but it didn't matter because they couldn't do anything to him if they didn't want to make their terrible situation worse than it already was. And to think that seven years ago you all banished me from this village for doing my job while I sat in this very chair, bleeding from two separate wounds given to me by the Uchiha who you all love so much, Naruto smirked. Watch your mouth, brat, said the merchant district's head, standing up and slamming his hands against the table in rage. He had made his hatred for Naruto known throughout the village since the Kayubi had killed his wife and daughter, and he would make the beast pay for the rest of his life. The only saving grace in his mental state was that he remarried years later and started a new family with two new children. He'd told his family what had happened to his old family, and hoped that they, too, despised Naruto for who he was. Once the seals on the brat's rightful home were broken, he even won the auction to move into it, which became a personal victory in his book because he had taken what was rightfully his all along but had been denied to him his entire life. Give us one good reason why we shouldn't just capture you and move on. Why don't you sit the fuck down and shut the hell up? Said Naruto, his voice tinged with rage. His response had been unexpected because they all assumed Naruto was still the same bumbling kid he had been years before. Sure, he appeared to be physically stronger, but they all assumed he was still mentally weak. You dare speak to me in such a manner? exclaimed the civilian councilman, furious at being talked down to. Anbu. Capture this brat and hold nothing back. You'd be wasting your time, Naruto said with a smirk as he closed his eyes. And why is that, Danzo wondered, knowing he was about to capture him as soon as he left the room. Three simple reasons, Naruto explained, holding up his hand with three fingers extended. The first is that I am a shadow clone, so hurting or capturing me is pointless in the end. That's impossible, Kaharu said, because when we banished you, we sealed off your chakra. Did you really think I wouldn't be able to remove them? Said Naruto, satisfied. Jiraiya may consider himself a master in the art of sealing, but he is pathetic when it comes to the Uzumaki, which is my clan. One that you have all failed to mention to me my entire life or, in the case of the elders and higher-ups in their so-called wisdom, deliberately failed to tell me. You watch your mouth, brat! Yelled Jiraiya, enraged that his ceiling was being mocked. Come over here and make me pervert, Naruto said as he made a come at me, motion with his middle finger, but in the end I will just vanish and this meeting will end before it even begins, so shut your perverted ass up before I make you my bitch by shoving my hand up your ass and working you like a fucking puppet. Jiraiya growled as he was told that, but he conceded that Naruto. Oh. Naruto realized as his other shadow clone dispersed, to whichever one of you assholes moved into the house that is mine, I burned it down with your family knocked out and inside, and they are now dead. What? exclaimed the merchant's head, leaping from his seat and foaming at the mouth in rage. He was held back by three Anbu. You killed my family you demon. Hey said Naruto as he shrugged his shoulders, I was set on fire 17 times in my life. Three times by your very hand, and I came out okay. You had no right. It was my house and they were trespassing. According to the laws of this very village I was within my right to do so and I acted on it. Perhaps if your children were Jinchuriki instead of me then they would still be alive right now, wouldn't they? The council member broke free from the grip of the Anbu holding him, and charged at Naruto. Naruto simply chopped the air, which an experienced shinobi would have known to avoid, but the councilman was no such thing and was knocked out cold by the pressure behind it. Reason number two, getting back on track here, said Naruto, is that you don't have the power to fight me. The shinobi who invaded Wave could attest to that. That is if they were still alive to tell you anything at all. You killed my shinobi, Tsunade snarled as she heard this. 
This meant that Naruto was far stronger than they had believed so that controlling him would be more of a challenge than they had hoped. They were invading a neutral country and were going to kill my friends, said Naruto with a straight face, so you better believe I killed them. And Uzumaki protects their friends and family, not that you follow that philosophy which honestly makes me question if you were adopted into the clan since you failed to follow our most basic of creeds. Tsunade growled more as she heard Naruto insult her, but calmed herself since he would suffer later when it was all over. And the last reason, said Naruto with another smile, if somehow you were able to manage capturing me, the same person that gave me diplomatic immunity by talking to your daimyo would not only be pissed beyond all reason, but she has gone on to state that she would not only join the other two villages in this war but supply them with chakra armor and airships as well. You are already in a war with your chances of winning being slim to none, so think about it if your enemies get that tech. Your chances would be reduced from slim to impossible. So if there is nothing else in the form of challenging me, let's get back to business since that is the reason that I am here. Fine, said Tsunade, as you are aware, we are at war with Kumo and Iwa. We have lost all of our alliances since you have been banished. We would like to offer you a full pardon of past crimes in return of returning to service. Is that all you're going to offer me? Chuckled Naruto as he heard their so-called offer. You banished me for doing my job and bringing back the Uchiha in one piece instead of killing him like the traitor he was. You sealed off my chakra, which I unsealed with some help, and sent me out in the world all so you could steal what was rightfully mine. And to top it off, you sent a group of hunter nin. You will be granted a seat as a clan head, and as such, the Clan Restoration Act will be enacted, allowing you to choose multiple wives to give birth to the next generation of Uzumaki. So you will allow me to sit in this room alongside the rest of you with the acknowledgement that I am a member of a clan that this village has cast out from the history books, where my one voice will never carry much weight in the grand scheme of things because all of you hate me, and where you will use me to breed a new vessel for you to contain Kyubi whenever you find a way to contain me. You are married? Asked Tsunade in shock, to whom? Like I would tell you so you could kidnap her and force me to comply. I will repeat that I am neither gullible nor naive. Plus, is it so difficult to hear that I am married? I can see that for you because you are a spiteful bitch who hates the concept of love since your old lover died years ago and you just hate to see people happy and in love in general. What will it take for you to come back and aid us in this war? Growled Tsunade who had grown tired of these games as well as the insults Naruto was throwing her way and just wanted it over with so they could plan on saving the village while her and Jiraiya planned on detaining Naruto once it was over. I could easily tell you what I want from you all, said Naruto with a grin on his face, but that would be too easy in my mind. I want to hear the offers that you have to give me. I want to hear the very people here who made my life a living hell beg for my help. To see how much they are truly willing to offer to save themselves from the war that they started themselves by banishing me and severing all ties with alliances and trading agreements with people I helped. Fine, Tsunade said with a frown because she didn't want to say what was about to be said. She was about to choke on them, but she had orders from the fire daimyo himself, and his word was law in this part of the world. In exchange for your service, you are to be immediately inaugurated into the position of Hokage on the orders of the fire daimyo himself, but with the stipulation that you assist the village in repairing the alliances and trading agreements we have lost, she said, breaking the awkward silence. They expected the brat to come back with the first offer because he was desperate for a home after being away for so long. You're offering me the position of Hokage, Naruto said, his face blank. Tsunade smirked internally thinking she had enticed the brat to help them with this offer. Yes, Tsunade said as she rolled the scroll that the fire daimyo had written for Naruto to sign if he accepted, and there is your proof. Will you help us? Naruto looked over the scroll and read what was written. He knew it was genuine because he saw the seal and the daimyo's signature. All he had to do was sign it and he would become Hokage as was written on the scroll. Naruto began to laugh as he put the scroll down after reading what was on it. And what is so funny, asked Tsunade who was confused at his reaction to their offer. 
It's just that I have always wanted this position ever since I was a child since it meant that I had the respect of all in the village. And now that it is being offered to me there is only one thing I could say. And that would be, said Tsunade who was expecting a simple yes or a nod from him. No, said Naruto as he blew out a small stream of fire to burn the scroll into ash. What? exclaimed the entire room, having long expected him to take the bait when offered what he desired. You're all really pathetic with this offer. You think I didn't hear things by snooping around when I was younger? You all thought I was so weak back then when I was on Team 7 and wondered why I was even allowed to become a shinobi in the first place instead of being made into an emotionless weapon like Danzo over there has been wanting for years. But. But, said Tsunade, who had run out of ideas for what to offer Naruto at this point because there was nothing better to offer. And since there is obviously no other offer to try and persuade me to return to this place that has become the bane of my very existence, Naruto said as he stood up and prepared to dispel, then I will take my leave. I would say it has been nice catching up with you all, but I am a bad liar and you would see through it in an instant. Wait, Tsunade said, I want to make a bet with you, Tsunade saw Naruto's interest in making a bet with her. A bet? With me? Are you sure you want to given how bad you are at gambling? Thought Naruto, placing his hand under his chin. Yes, a bet. You and me fight in the arena, Tsunade said, seeing Naruto's interest. No, said Naruto as he shook his head. And why not? Don't think you can take on one of the legendary Sanin in a fight? I know that I can. Said Naruto, it's just the fact that our fight would be over too quickly. So here is my proposal to your little wager. As it stands your village is basically doomed as it is with me being the only chance you have at survival. I will fight you, but not just you. I want to fight everybody who thinks they can challenge me. Remember that I single-handedly defeated so many Iwa shinobi along with their cage so keep that in mind. But what is the wager behind this fight? If we win, you must rejoin our ranks as a shinobi of Konoha once more, Tsunade said smugly, confident that they could defeat Naruto with proper planning. Agreed, Naruto replied, but when I win, just know that I will rip your head off your body and mount it on my wall. What? Tsunade exclaimed, surprised that he would say such a thing. You are a bitch plain and simple so I think it a fitting end for you to not only die horrifically but to have your very body desecrated with your head on my wall so that I may laugh at it whenever I see it and know that you were foolish enough to piss me off," said Naruto as he remembered his mother's last words which were to hang Tsunade's head on his wall for her. If nothing else, he was a man of his word. And one more thing, make sure Sasuke fights as well. I unlocked his eyes so he could fight me at full strength rather than being a pussy and hiding in the shadows to strike from behind. Then the bet is settled, Tsunade said. That it is, Naruto said as he prepared to dispel himself once more, see you all in a week at noon. Oh, and a quick word of advice before I dispel. Tell your men to come at me with killing intent. Otherwise, they won't survive this. And with that, the clone dispelled, leaving those in the room with their thoughts and futile plans for the future. So that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel for more awesome stories like this. Thank you. See you all in my next video.